Crossroads. How are you? I'm glad you're good. That was the only good I got. Come on, people. <laughs> I'm Laura Pagorni. I help out around here. One of the ways I, uh, I help, um, I run the coffee team. We're always looking for volunteers on that. Thank you for the applause. So uh, see me about that later. Um, just want to extend an extra warm welcome. First for everyone that, uh, everyone obviously that uh, ventured out in the snow. Um, but those of you that are home online too in your jammies, we really appreciate you checking in on us too, right? Extra warm welcome for that. So uh, just wanted to bring a few announcements to you. Sorry, I'm making noise here. I'll try to make that quieter, sorry. Just wanted to bring a couple announcements to you, things that are happening around here. Post high school and 20-somethings, uh, they're gonna meet tomorrow at Pastor Phil's house. There is contact information in the bulletin if uh, you know someone that'd be interested in that. Um, or else you can send us an email at info at ecrossroads.net and we can get you the information. Men's group has resumed. They've been meeting for a couple weeks now and they want to make sure that everybody, every guy, not everybody, every guy here, single, widow, divorced, married, all of you, you're all invited to attend. So that's every Tuesday at 7.30 here at the church. And uh, they also have a men's retreat planned for um, the middle of May. There's a sign-up sheet for that over at the welcome table. And I'll be there after the service. You can... Uh, Ask me some questions about that if necessary, or I, or I can get you hooked up to one of the fellas. The youth group is going to have their, what we used to, what we were calling the progressive dinner, but because of COVID, they had to cancel it, so it's now being called the regressive dinner, trying to make up for that. Friday the 18th, 545, they're going to meet here and carpool to particular houses for all the courses of a dinner. Then they'll come back here around 9-ish for dessert. So you can see Pastor Ben for that, right? <laughs> for that. Um, and then Pastor Dave, uh, one of his counseling partners, are going to be heading up a one-day uh, marriage workshop here at the church uh, March 26th. Space is limited. I think there's a few slots still available. The sign-up sheet is over at that welcome table. You can meet me there and uh, we can chat about that. Uh, there is a cost of $45 per couple. That includes all the material and lunch that will be provided. Um, and scholarships are available, so don't let the, uh, the funds scare you on that. You can talk to us, and we can help you out with that. Again, anything I'm saying here, people at home, send an email, in, uh, info at ecrossroads.net, and we'll make sure that you get connected with all that. So speaking of connection, we want to make sure that everyone is connected to how they can plug in around here, and there's lots of ways to do that. We have our website. We have the app. Uh, we have our Facebook page. We have the bulletin that you got when you came in. And um, certainly any of us here, you can talk to us there. Um, and the last announcement we have, our worship pastor, Jen, is going to tell us about that, and then she'll lead us in our call to worship. So thanks. All right, so an event that we have on our calendar is called the Prayer Partners Pizza Pop Patisserie Party. Woo! <laughs> Who in here knows what a patisserie is? Anyone? No one. All right, so my husband and I and one of our daughters, we have been watching the British Baking Show a bunch. 
I suppose you should know what a patisserie is probably. Just a little French uh, dessert. So this is gonna be an event. I'm really looking forward to it. I really hope that all, you can all make it. So it's for people who are in the prayer ministry partner ministry and if you're not and you want to be it's a fine I'm not going to turn anyone away we're going to come and we're going to have all this stuff so pizza's provided pop is well it's provided if anyone feels like they want to bring some that'd be great I'm going to try my hand at patisseries you know Jeff if you want to join me in that that's fine <laughs> you don't do French I don't either but hey I'm trying I'm going to try so uh yeah I would be really great to see you this is just going to be a night where we party. We celebrate how God is working in this prayer ministry. We share stories with each other. So, you know, you could also come a little bit prepared to share something about how God's working in the ministry. If you're, you know, making a new friendship, if you really sense God working in your life in a new way with this, I just, I feel like God is going to be working in this ministry and I want to share that with each other. So hopefully you guys can make it. All right. So that is that. If you guys would please stand. And we're going to do our call to worship. I will read, and then you guys follow with the bold words with these guys. We look in the mirror, and what do we see? We see people who try to be faithful, even as questions and struggles challenge our faith. We look in the mirror, and how do we see? We see with hearts which are open to God's love, with lives which seek to trust when all the evidence tells us not, not to be so foolish. We look in the mirror, and who do we see? We see Jesus, the one who entered into our struggling world and showed us the way of faithfulness. Let's lift our voices in worship. Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all I know No, oh, I won't be shaken No, oh, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, oh, I won't be shaken No, oh, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love Let's sing that one more time Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love.
Welcome to Crossroads. My name is Joe. I'm one of the uh, pastors around here. It's nice to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in the room or uh, at home or on your way to work and on the live stream. Um, so thanks for being here as we take our offering. We want this to be a place of freedom, and that applies to the offering, so feel no obligation to participate in this part of the service, especially if you're visiting with us today. If you do want to participate in the room, there is a box, uh, offering box in the back at home. People have been using the app or the website or mailing in their offerings, which we appreciate. And today... Uh, we always take a look at the words of scripture as we take our offering. And so today we read these. I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Those are some of the most beautiful words of all of scripture. They remind us of God's love, of God's power. And they come to us from a guy whose life is a complete and utter mess. He's going through tragedy. He's going through loss. He's going through pain. And so they are a testimony of, of faith, faith in God. And at a time when a faith is being tested. So we're going to talk about that today in the message. We're going to come back to these words of scripture from the book of Job because that's where we are uh, right now in the scriptures. But we'll just for this moment, right, to remember that no matter what's going on in our lives, you know, and certainly you don't have to look far to see tragedy. But we stick with God and we stay with God and our testimony is that in the end, God is good and God will bring about goodness. All right, so the other thing, talk about bringing goodness, and I got to do this one while the kids are still in because... We are going to have a 5K. It is going to be May 7th. 5K is 3.1 miles. We're going to start at Millennium Middle School. Some of you guys, we got, I don't see any Millennium kids right. Some of you are going to be at Millennium in a couple of years, but not yet. Um, we're going to start on the Millennium track. We're going to go through town. We're going to go through McCaddy Park, back to the middle school and have a have a celebration, and all the money we raise is going to go to Renewed Hope Counseling Center, Active Faith, and Capernaum Health Clinic. So if you want to be a part of that, you just go to the website, and you can click on where it says Community Care 5K. That'll take you to the registration site. We've done this in the past with, and you know, some of you have participated with kids, and kids always have uh, always have a fun time on it. We call it, we say it's a fun walk or run. Most of the people end up walking and that's, that's great. So it, it, have fun and join us for that. And it's all, it's all good causes that we are raising money for. Finally, I want to just do a, a prayer request of one of the people uh, in, who's in the background of our, our church family is Jay Johnson. Jay does a lot of work with Renewed Hope Counseling Center. She has sat on the board of Renewed Hope Counseling Center. I think since, since we started, since, you know, we started the board there, which was a number of years ago, she's a professional counselor. She does a lot of work with addiction and helping people get free from addiction. She's just awesome human being. And she's struggling with brain cancer right now, so she would enjoy uh, all of our prayers, and she would ask us to be in prayer for her. So if you could be in prayer for Jay, and we're going to pray for her right now, and then I'll leave you a space to pray for any other uh, intentions that you have. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for Jay. She, if, for those of us who don't know her, for those of us who do know her, she just always got a smile, always got a good attitude, knows how to work through difficult things. So guide her and lead her as she works through this difficult thing. Let her feel your love and your grace and your goodness and let your healing touch be all upon her. And now I invite you in the silence of your hearts to lift any other intentions that you have. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you with our prayers and our concerns. We love you, and now we're going to lift our voices and praise you. In Jesus' holy name and all God's people said, amen. All right, kids, you got the one and only Miss Shannon and Michaela at the back door. Jack 
<laughs> if you are. <laughs> I appreciate that when you all leave, you don't do that, okay? It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's over. All right, let's ride. <laughs> let's, let's lift our voices. <laughs> is awesome. I love it so much. I always I can take a deeper breath after I sing that song. Between the services, I read something about how God's name, Yahweh, is Y-H-W-H, and it's the sound of breathing. So in everything that we do, everywhere we go, we're praying Yahweh, Yahweh, and we're praying, and in our lives, we're giving praise, and we're praying through everything that we're doing. next song we're singing is Lament. And I'm surprised always by how much hope there is in this next song. But it's such a wonderful bringing our pain. And even in that, we're still praying. We're still praising. And God is near to the broken. And he's here for us. You say you're near to the passes understanding you see
to breaking come close just before your presence come close when a pain is crushing come close she touched your hem and As we're moving into our time of praise, lament, hope, and confession, we would like to start by reading the Lord's Prayer with you. So if you'll join us. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy will will be done, on earth as as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we're going to move into the praise section. And we're going to be singing singing, the Lord's Prayer again. But this time we're going to split up three different versions from three versions of the Bible. And Jenny's going to read the first section, and then Kelly, and then me. And it really gives an extra level to the wonder of the versions. Um, if If you guys can read with Jenny... And you guys can read with Kelly in this vaguely center group. (laughs) It's hard to break up five. (laughs) Um, 
can read third with me. Uh, the different versions, it's just a little bit different and it just kind of brings a new level of understanding. All right, let's read together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven, let your name remain holy. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. And now, as we move into the time of lament, let's take some time to just be still. As we look at our lives and our world, we lament the current conditions. And we read together. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Bring about your kingdom, manifest your will here on earth as it is manifest in heaven. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. And now let's move into hope. Let's pray together. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us each day that that day's bread, no more and no less. Keep us alive with three square meals. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Let your kingdom be and let it be powerful and glorious forever. You're in charge. You can do what anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. You are good, you are good, I believe you are good, you are good, you are good, I still Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who owe us something. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Keep us safe from ourselves and from the devil. So let's just take a moment to be with God. I just invite you to close your eyes. Take that deep breath. And just be at his feet. And lay before him all those ways that we know we've failed and even the ways that we're not aware of all of our sin all of our shame and just lay it at the foot of the cross
And Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come to you in confession, the answer is always yes. Your arms are always open wide. That you have forgiven us of our sins. And we are just coming to you so that so that we can become more and more like you. So that the areas of our lives where we don't love you like we're called to and we don't love our neighbor like we're called to, that you can you can just continue to do the work you do in our lives so we can love like you love and be the people in this time and place you call us to be. Make it so we know you will. All God's people said, amen. As we uh, come to our time of uh, communion, if you need uh, the elements, Nancy is going to come and bring them around. If you're at home, uh, you can simply uh, pause the live stream and uh, go grab a little piece of bread and a cup if you'd like. But we conclude our time of prayer uh, and worship with communion because it's just such a beautiful reminder of who our God is and what it means to follow God. The Apostle Paul says, when you eat this bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we proclaim Jesus as Lord, we're proclaiming him as God, the God we love, the God we follow. And when we proclaim his death, we're proclaiming that that death is a freeing death, that it saves us from our sins and it frees us to live the life that God has called us, God has called us to live. So to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes is to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. And if you come this morning, you say, well, I don't proclaim that. Well, thank you so much for being on this journey. We're not going to ask you to proclaim something that you don't believe. But again, I'm grateful that you're here. And I'd invite you to keep coming and learning about this journey and what it looks like. And we'll take the elements at the end. But what we're remembering is what Jesus told us to remember. Remember that on the night before he died, he took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his loved ones. He said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. Then he took a cup. He said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This cup is my blood shed for you, shed for many, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We humbly ask you to bless this bread and bless the cup. May it remind us of your love, but so much more than that, may it fill us with your love and connect us with your love. May it make your love alive and real and present in our lives so that we can walk through this broken world knowing you're with us and shining your light and bringing your love into the broken places you would take us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. My brothers and sisters, the body of Christ broken for you, take and eat. the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. And once more, join me in prayer. Father, as you've met us, as we've listed our voices, we've lifted our prayers, now continue to guide us and lead us. We turn our attention to your wisdom and your way, to your holiness, your words of grace and goodness. And if my words get in the way, just let them go away. So your light would shine in this time and place. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, Dave, would you do me a favor? I think before the end here, I'm going to need some water. My cup is right, right there. If you could just get me a cup, that would be great. Um, all right, so do you have any nervous habits? You know, some of us chew our nails. Some of us, not me, twirl our hair, right? Get that little thing like you're nervous and you start twirling. Yeah. <laughs> found one, right? <laughs> you found that one and you start really, you get a hold of it. Um, mine... My nervous, thanks bro, my nervous thing is over brushing my teeth. <laughs> I, I'm serious. So like, I just, like, 
because you know what happens is I just get going, right? And I'm just, and like, you just keep going, right? And I show up at the, um, at the, you know, the dentist and they're like, you your gums wouldn't bleed if if there were some gums left, right? Like you got to, you, you just brush too hard. And then so like buy a soft brush. And I would just push harder on my soft brush. <laughs> Joanne was like, my wife Joanne was in the last, <laughs> in the last uh, service. And she's like, and he goes through brushes in three days. <laughs> Right? They're just, the bristles are gone in like three days. So finally, I mean, I, I got the use a soft breast suggestion. I don't know how many times. Finally, somebody said, one of my hygienists said, have you ever considered an electric toothbrush? And I'm like, no. So this is now my toothbrush. And this thing is amazing. First off, I can't go too long. Because after two minutes, it shuts off. It's got a timer, right? So it's like if I'm lost in thought, which can happen, and I'm like, it just stops. I'm like, oh, time to be lost in thought somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> the next day, I got two minutes on the other. <laughs> and then here's the beauty. If I push too hard, it stops. It will not let me push too hard. It just stops. I, I now have enamel on my teeth again. I have, my gums are fine, right? And this, we want all life to be like this toothbrush. We want it to be simple. We want it to be easy. We want it to have a timer that, you know, just things turn off when they need to turn off. If things get too hard, everything stops doesn't keep going. But you've come on a day where we're talking about the book of Job. So we know that that's not life, right? So we're in this book, the book of Job. Where are you, God? And last week we looked at Job 1 and 2. I'm going to review them a, a little bit later. But we were, last week we found out like we can't know. We, we can't always know what's going on in the world. We can't understand what's going on in the world. But we can we can put our faith and our trust in God. And so today, then when you're in the storm, next week, when you're out of the storm, and then this final week, it's going to be, we're going to go from Job to Jesus to us. And, and we're going to see how we're, you know, called to live in this world. So today, though, it's when you're in the storm. When you're in the storm of tragedy and in bad things. And like I say, we all want it to end in two minutes when the timer goes off. Well, my heart's broken and, okay, my, you know, two minutes are up. Now I just go on with life. So people for years have been trying to help us understand grief and pain and our response to tragedy and our response to the difficult things in life. One of the most famous, she did a wonderful job with this uh, back in the 60s and 70s, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. A, a lot of you know this because it's, it's so famous. And she just studied it and worked on it. And so she had this kind of roadmap of, you know, you, at first... There's denial, and then you go through a phase of anger, a phase of depression, then there's bargaining, and then there's acceptance, okay? And you move through, you move through those stages. As she thought about it more, she added in shock. Shock is that place where you're just numb, and it doesn't feel real. If you are in a place of shock, you know, sometimes, like, you wake up the next day, and you don't even remember, but then you have this rec moment of recognition, like, you know, you're, you're up and you start to brush your teeth and you're like, oh yeah, that happened. Or, oh yeah, I got that diagnosis. So that's shock, right? And then testing is where you're trying on, okay, how am I going to get through this difficulty and what does my new life look like, right? So... You test out, am I going to go to a support group or am I going to go to a counselor? But that, that's all part of it. So that, so as you look at that, again, you, we want it to be the toothbrush. We want it to be neat and easy. And again, when the timer goes off, I'm done with grief. And what do we always say? We get on with life, 
right? So that's the road you think you're going to get. But in reality, this is probably the road you got, right? Up, down, circles all around, and doesn't make sense, right? And so it is so important, right, that we understand the journey of faith. It's important that we, we understand it's not neat. It, it, it's important that we understand when things get too hard, life doesn't stop. It keeps going. I see a lot of parents in this room, right? Like it keeps going and your kid still needs to get to school. And you still need milk for cereal, right? So the importance of understanding the journey of faith. There, um, a beautiful member of our church family, she's moved to Texas to be closer uh, to her grandchildren. It's, it's Deb Sherman. Uh, some of you, many of you in the room uh, know Deb. And, uh, but, but not all of you do, especially if you're newer to the church. But Deb had a tragic loss of her uh, husband, and it was just one of those things, he just, he just died, like it was, he went to sleep on an airplane, and he didn't wake up, and the, the doctors never really, I remember she called the day, well, I got the report back from the medical examiner, and it still doesn't make any sense, I mean, his heart stopped, but they like really couldn't find a lot wrong, like there were no major blockages, that type of thing. So it's that first week and she's in that shock place and I'm sitting at her dining room table and, you know, we set aside this time to talk through the funeral service, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to, you know, lay this out. And, um, and she opens up her Bible to sit down to do this and she has the notes from a sermon, you know, that I like this one that I'm about to give. It was a sermon on how you get through bad times and what does it look like when you're going through bad times. And she pulls it out and she reads the points and she's like, that's how I'm going to get through. Now, because she's in the shock place, she's like, I don't, I remember that night. I don't remember that specific part of that night. But when she pulled out those sermon notes, on the one hand, my heart broke for her because I'm like, oh, she's got it. That's what she's got ahead of her. That's what she's going through. That's the pain that, that she's going through, right? She's gonna, have to, she's gonna have to live into that. And at the same time, I was glad that she had that. And I was glad that we had talked about it because part of our job, you know, my job, Dave's job, right, is, is to tell you what's real and to tell you that in this life you will have trouble and to help so when the trouble hits, it's not a foreign, right? Like, you'll, you'll, you're not going to be ready for it, okay? <laughs> Nobody's ready for it but you'll understand a little bit what's going on and you'll be able to walk forward. So one of the ways we do that around here is we have this thing called the discipleship journey, right? And I remember when we were putting it together, it was like, how do we show the messiness of life, right? So the discipleship journey, it's in your programs. Before I go through it, we always say, wherever you're at in the journey, you're welcome here. If we're a healthy church, there should be people who have been believers for 50 years and people who have been believers for five weeks. Or there are people who, you know, grew up in the church but walked away and they're like, ah, maybe it's time for me to get back, right? Like that whole gamut should exist. And it should be, you should feel like, you know what, if I have a question, I can ask it. Right, like, so wherever you're at in the journey, you're welcome here. But like, so we started with this, right? So we start off, and we're curious about who is this God? What does it mean to follow? You say Jesus is Lord and Savior. What does that mean? We get convicted. We say, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. We start to make commitments. We, you know, join the men's group or, uh, you know, show up on Sundays help out with the worship team, sit, you know, doing the back, do tech, or 
and just and provide meal, you know, hey, I got to bring a meal for the for the funeral luncheon that we're doing, right? We start to do those things. And then we get consistent. You know, our faith becomes more a part of who we are and how we live our lives. And that would be great if there was never any crisis in our lives, right? So to, so to show the messiness of life, you know, we put the crisis in the middle and then we had lines going that at any point of your journey, the crisis can hit. And when the crisis hits, now you're curious, where are you, God? What's going on in my life? What did I do to deserve this? That's, what we see, that's where we see Job. And so on your, if you look at the discipleship journey, it's you know, like it's in your membership packet, it's in the program. We, it, I, Dave and I preach on it at least a couple of times a year probably more. Um, but if you look, there's a little asterisk next to the crisis, and it takes you down to this statement. The biggest tests of faith typically happen in the middle of our journey when a crisis hits. Now, today we're going to talk about tragedy, and these other ones we're going to talk about in two weeks uh, when we finish up this surgery. But tragedy, disappointment, boredom, burnout, doubt, or an old pattern of sin strikes us, and we find it hard to stick with it. Avoid the temptation to drop out. Simply show up. Why? God will meet you in your doubts and frustrations and bring you to a new level of faith. God will stick with us and walk with us in our doubts, in our pains, in our laments, in our cryouts. So back to the book of Job. Last week, we ended up with this we, we can't know. So as you're reading uh, the book of Job, in, in Job 1 and 2, we get all this background information. And the background information we get is that God is having this discussion with Satan. And Satan, as we learned last week, is our hostile opponent. He's the accuser. He's the voice in your head that it, when you get the performance review that tells you you're fantastic, but you could just work on this one little thing that you spend the next six months obsessing about just that one little thing, right? The voice talking you down. So the accuser says to God, Satan says to God, God says to Satan, hey, well, you're out there accusing people, but look at Job, that guy's blameless. And Satan says, eh, he just follows you because he's got a good life. Got a lot of money, got a lot of kids. Who wouldn't follow you? He's got everything. Take that away from him. Take his health away from him. See how much he worships you then. Okay? That's Job 1 and 2. You know that's going on as you read, the, as you read it. I know what's going on as we read it. Who doesn't know what's going on is Job and his friends who come to comfort him. And so here's the things that we learned from, from Job last week, right? Job was blameless. This is really important to understand this point because the modern way we do our faith can send us on a little bit of a, uh, send us off on this one, right? We say nobody's blameless for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody's blameless. But what Job mean, what, what the book of Job means here, I mean, first of all, we have to say Job was blameless because God says it, right? God says, have you considered my, jo my, friend, my servant Job? He's blameless and upright. So we can think about it this way as we try to understand this and as we try to understand, you know, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. If, if I, you know, get a fifth and get myself blackout drunk and go drive and kill somebody as I'm sitting in my jail cell two years later, I, in the back of my head, even if I'm complaining and moaning, in the back of my head, I know I'm guilty. Like, okay, I did this and I deserve to be sitting here. But the family of the people who love that person who lost their life in my stupidity, 
they're blameless. They didn't do anything to bring that about. And yet they are suffering in ways that I wouldn't even be able to fathom. Right? So Job in our story is blameless. He doesn't do anything to bring about all the ugliness that's happening to him. But who does bring it about is Satan. And Satan has real influence. If you, if you doubt that, just spend five minutes looking at what's going on in Ukraine. That's straight from the pit of hell. That's evil. That's Satan. And so, but again, we learn this in the first two chapters, right? But, but don't make this mistake, right? It's God and Satan are equal, okay? They're not. God is supreme. God rules. So how do we understand the bad things that happen? For reasons we don't know, for reasons we can't fathom, because as scripture tells us, we know in part, we know in part, part of being human is we don't know everything. God, how this one writer, Christopher Ash says it, God gives sobering permissions. We, we can't understand why, but we know that that happens. So that's Job 1 and 2. So last week, we can't know. This week, when you're in the storm, which brings us now to Job 3, Okay. And our guy, Christopher Ash, and trusting God in the darkness, says it like this. Job 3 is an important chapter for contemporary Christianity, us. Today, we find a version of Christianity that is shallow, trite, superficial, and happy clappy. It's a kind of Christianity that, as some have said, would have had Jesus singing a chorus at Lazarus' grave. Let me pause here for a second when if I have to do like a funeral where it's a tragedy okay I often use Jesus at Lazarus's grave to help the people understand what's going on so here's Jesus at Lazarus's grave Jesus the son of God the king of kings the lord of lords and the scriptures say he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled and he wept. He's deeply moved in spirit. And if you've been at one of those services, you've probably heard me do this before. But he's deeply moved in spirit. Is his whole body physically reacted. Right? He physically reacted. The, the Greek underneath that is he snorted. Like, you know how a horse snorts, right? Like his whole body shook. And, and it's like he snorted with anger. And his mind was troubled, like all that confusion that we have in our head, all that fuzziness, all that this doesn't feel right, all this, I want this to go away. He felt that. Jesus, the resurrection and the life, at that moment felt that and he wept real tears he had real sorrow and, and we don't right it's God can do it all we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me then you go through a tragedy and you're like well I can't go to church because they're just gonna tell me some happy right it's a kind of Christianity that, as some have said, would have Jesus singing a chorus at Lazarus' grave. We have all met it. Easy triumphalism. We sing of God in one song that in the presence, in the presence our problems disappear, and in another that my love just keeps on growing. Neither was true for Job in chapter 3, and yet he was a true and blameless believer. So here's Job chapter 3. Before Job, so we get to the end of chapter 2, and what happens at the end of chapter 2, I didn't give it to you last week, so I'm giving it to you now. His friends show up. And they sit in silence for seven days. There's great, great wisdom 
in sitting in silence for seven days. Because sometimes the pain we are going through is just bigger than words. And it's just enough to be in our presence, right? My, my, uh, my mom, um, who taught me so much, but I got my hyperactivity from her. <laughs> and I remember a, a tragedy that my, befell my family a number of years ago was the death of my niece. And we had gone to New York because she was in college and, and um, that's the IC, you know, that was the trauma center. And um, she was in ICU, um, but she was only in ICU um, so that they could, you know, harvest her organs. And, and we knew that we had lost her, uh, but we were going, and my mom, she didn't know what to do. She didn't know what to say. And so that was the only time I just taught my mom about ministry because she looked at me, her pastor's son, and like, what are we supposed to do right now? And I just like, nothing, man. It's just enough that we're here. We're, we, it's just enough. So we did that. We just stayed, and we were present. So the seven days are up. Job's friends have come. They're hanging with him, and Job is the first to speak. And he says this. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may the day of my birth perish and the night that said a boy is conceived. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and other darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May blackness overwhelm it. The word of the Lord. Our buddy Elizabeth Kubler-Ross would say, Job is in the depression stage. Yeah, that's real. And that's scripture, and that is a statement of faith. Now, how is that a statement of faith? It's a statement of faith on a couple of levels. Number one, it's a statement of faith because it recognizes that God is good and that is not the way the world is supposed to work and that's not what God is leading us toward. So, so the statement of faith is, look, if it's all just random, you know, some somehow everything came out of nothing. But if it's all just randomly, everything came out of nothing, molecules running into molecules, bad stuff happens, eh, it happens, right? There's no rhyme, there's no reason. But if God is in his universe and God is in control and God is good, when you cry out your pain like that, what you're saying is, God, I know it's supposed to be different because I have faith in you. Secondly, it's a statement of faith because it has the courage to bring our whole selves to God. You're in a, you're in a relationship with somebody and they hold, they're, like, they're mad, they're angry, but they hold it back because they can't risk bringing you that truth at that moment. Job brings God his truth. He said, we say we have a relationship with God. That means we can bring the ugly moments of our life, the, the depressed moments of our life, the painful moments of our life. Let me pause on this just really quickly because I didn't do this in the last service, so maybe we'll use the second one. But um, Dave and I were talking about this uh, yesterday. What I want to say about this moment of depression Right, this is depression. And when you go through tragedy, you're gonna go through depression. When a, when, a, when a bad thing happens in your life, you're gonna go through that. It doesn't mean you're weird. 
It doesn't mean you're not faithful. It doesn't mean you don't love Jesus. It means you're a human being in a broken world and you're seeing the brokenness and it hurts. And so there is, counselors will say, right, there is something called complex grief. I think the official title is persistent bereavement disorder syndrome, something like that. Okay, it's, it's in the DSM, all right? <laughs> Most people don't have that, okay? If you're going through a hard time, like some, what's wrong with me? I sometimes have to say to people, if you weren't crying, then we would have something to be talking about. You need to be crying right now. You just went through a really hard thing. And because... Happy, clappy Christianity says, no, you got to be right. Jesus loves you. I can do all things through God. Strengthen me. To... That's all true. And so is that. So is Job 3. That's what he was feeling at that moment. He had the courage to bring it to God. Right? Like, <laughs> we, it, this would never sell, but we could do it just, you know, for fun for us, right? Instead of like the 365-day calendar of how, you know, God's wonderful promises to us, let's just do our own one, right? Like, January 1st, in this life, you will have trouble, okay? January 2nd, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you are going through as if something strange were happening to you, right? And we do a dis me, Dave, people in our position do a disservice to the people in our care when we just, right, just name it and claim it and say it's, you know, a, a, a not, you know, talk it into existence in the name of Jesus, right? It, we do you no favors when we don't tell you in this life you will have trouble. And okay, but take heart, I've overcome the world. How did Jesus overcome the world, right? So here we go. When you're in the storm, remember this. Job is 42 chapters and the vast majority is poetry. Because, so prose is, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. We, under, we know this about God, this about God, this about God. Poetry is just our hearts pouring out. I just read you poetry. I'm about to read you a little bit more. It's 42 chapters and the vast majority is poetry because we're in the area where it's beyond our understanding. But what we do understand is we're in pain. And we know we're in pain and it, it doesn't feel good. And the road looks like that loop-de-loop -loop craziness where you're up and down and all around. So avoid bad theology. As I read the poetry in a second, I'll point out the bad theology. But last week, I, I go back and listen if you didn't have a chance to, but I spent a lot of time on what we might call karma theology. And there's a lot of it in the book of Job. And so, so karma theology says anything bad that's happening to you is your fault. You you brought it into existence. So go back to my, my thing. So the person who's blameless in my drunk driving tragedy that I threw out there for you, the person who's blameless is now saying, well, what did I do wrong? How come, right? Because karma theology says if it's bad happening to you, you did something. And I talked about this last week. Again, you can go back and listen, but... Like one way they do like when a bad thing happens to a child, they're like, well, how do you explain that? Well, they say, well, the child must have done something in a previous life. So great. So now we got to atone for all the previous lives plus this one. For those of us who struggle with guilt, I got enough for this one, right? So avoid bad theology. Job's bad theology, I'm going to point it out to you in just a second, is he forgets, he forgets about Satan. And he forgets about Satan and Satan's power. So number one, avoid bad theology. Number two, stick with your relationship with God. Don't leave. Don't drop out. 
And so stick with your relationship with God in worship. So worship is showing up, whether you show up online, whether you show up in the room, and it's more than that. I, I mean, the 60 minutes, okay, it's never 60 minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> the 75 minutes, right? It, that you got, we got seven day week. And so, you know, when Paul says in Romans, live your life, right? Live your life as true worship to God. Offer your, offer your whole life to God, right? So we live our lives in worship with God and worship includes lament. We, we've been trying to introduce over the last year, we, we've been trying to introduce lament more because we do not do a good job of this as the contemporary church. And now we've got it worked in so that there are times in, in the prayer time, in every service, there is time for that. So when the day, I hope the day comes that you never have to walk into this place after a tragedy. You never have to walk into this place after a bad diagnosis. You never have to walk into this place after the loss of a loved one. You never have to walk in this place after some failure in your life that's just made you miserable, Right? But if you do walk in, I want there to be a place for you where you can, you can bring that to God and, and you don't feel like, well, I just, you know, I got my Christian aerobics done. I did my jumping jacks. I sang my song and, right? So it includes lament. Uh, Sung Chen Ra is a, a professor and he talks about lament. Well, let me give you the official definition, right? It's a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. The problem with the Oxford uh, is that's not Christian lament goes beyond a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. I'm going to show it to you in one second. But Sung Chen uh, Ra is a professor, um, brilliant guy. He writes a book called Prophetic Lament. He says, the American church avoids lament. The power of lament is minimized and the underlying narrative of suffering that requires lament is lost. But absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. Absent makes the heart forget. The absence of lament in liturgy of the American church results in the loss of memory. We forget the necessity of lamenting over pain and suffering. We forget the reality of suffering and pain. Which is why we have so much trouble walking alongside of people when they're going through difficult times. We're going to talk about that next week. Sug Cheng Ra says, we forget the necessity of lamenting over suffering and pain. We forget the reality of suffering and pain. And so now we come to hope, right? Lament, Christian lament has hope built into it because it comes from a place of faith. And the faith is, God, I know this isn't how you want the story to end. I know you're leading us to a better place. So now we come to Job 19. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Beautiful. Let me read you the whole chapter. Here's Job chapter 19. His friends have been telling him, I'm going to point out the bad theology you're going to hear. His friends have been telling him, if you're suffering, it's because you did something wrong. God's not going to bring all this tragedy on you if you didn't do something wrong. Job, it's your fault. Confess and write and be done with it. What Job's bad theology is he forgets about Satan. And so he, they want to say it's your fault. And Job wants to say it's God's fault. And it's poetry, right? It's 42 chapters. And some of these poems from his friends are long. And Job is sick of it. And so chapter 19, Job replies, how long will you torment me? Ten times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attack me. 
If it's true that I have gone astray, that God's punishing me for some screw up of mine, my error remains my concern alone. If indeed you would exalt yourselves above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me. That's Job's bad theology. And drawn his net around me. Though I cry violence, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He has blocked my way so I cannot pass. He has shrouded my past in darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. His troops advance in force. They build a siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. That's being preached. If they have the courage, that's the lament that's happening right now on the other side of the world. He has alienated me from my family. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have gone away. My closest friends have forgotten me. My guests and my female servants count me as a foreigner. They look at me as a stranger. I summon my servant. He doesn't answer. Though I beg him with my own mouth. I can never say this next line without laughing. Sorry. Every time I come apart, I laugh. My breath is offensive to my wife. (laughs) I I can't do it. (laughs) My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own family. Even the little boys scorn me. When I appear, they ridicule me. All my intimate friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me, my friends, have pity, for the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? Now listen to this. Oh, that my words were recorded. They have been recorded. They've been given to us in the Holy Scriptures. They're a model for being true and honest with God. And when we're in pain, having the courage to bring it to God. Oh, that my words were encouraged, were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives. The Vindicator the one who will show that I am blameless, the one who will show me love. And and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. He brings it all. When you're in the midst of the struggle, you bring it all. And, and, as our pastor who's a licensed psychologist will tell you, you can try to pretend that you're not struggling with that depression. You can try to pretend that you're not having that anger. It's like taking a beach ball and holding it under the water. Good luck with that. Because as soon as you let it go, it's going to pop up. As Christians, we do it both. We're real with how we feel. And we're real that we believe. This is faith. Now, faith is being certain of what you hope for. It is evidence of things not yet seen. We haven't seen the beauty and the glory that we are headed toward, but we know we're headed toward there, and we know what we see now is not the end of the story. But we know in this moment, there will be pain. In this moment, there will be setbacks. In this moment, there will be sorrow. So we have the courage to bring it all to our God. And that's what gives us the strength to walk alongside other people who are hurting. 
So that's where we're going to go next week. But we want to finish with this, right? Stick with your relationship with God in worship, and that includes both lament and hope. We can be the lament-only church. We're not going to do that, okay? Because that would be ugly, right? People are clapping. Please, don't be the lament-only church. We can be the hope-only church. And then when you're going through a hard time, you walk through the doors and you're like, okay, I I guess I got to check out for the next six months because they got no clue. And I just got to put on, I got to put on a smile and pretend everything's fine. we're, We're the church of Jesus Christ. We do both like Jesus did both. So in, so in community, right? That's what this is for. I, I mean, my wife, Joanne, always, and, and she's less in the work world, um, but when she was a physical therapist and, you know, working 40 hours a week, it, she had the opportunity to do this more, but as her coworkers were going through difficult times, she would always say, I don't know how you do this without a church family. I, get a church family, right? And a Deb, who I talked about earlier, you know, she just, and, you know, Deb lost her husband, and now, you know, tragically, it's 11 months ago, tragically 11 months ago, lost her son. Um, and she just says, I don't know how you do this without God. And so Deb shows up. She shows up at Grief Share. She shows up at her church. She shows up with her family. And she's real. And she walks through it. And she deals with the emotions so that she can live in the hope. And that's the journey. So we're going to continue on with this next week. But here we, you know, will we have the courage to stick with God through all the storms of our lives? No matter what's going on, will we as the people of God have the courage to stick with God through all the storms of our life? You want to be an evangelist, you want to have a testimony, you want to bring everybody to Christ, that's how you do it. You show them that Christ is real in the midst of the ugliness, in the midst of the pain. That's the people we're called to be. I pray, right, I pray that none of us have to go through those tragic moments. That diagnosis that came out of the blue and means now, right, the phone call or, you know, Deb teaching her little elementary school kids with the principal at the door and finding out her whole world had just changed, right? And yet, if you're going to go through those places, I want you to know what it looks like. And I want you to be able to walk forward in faith and with confidence. And I want you to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that your Redeemer lives. He has come for you, he loves you, and he is here for you. And even when you don't know what's going on, and even when you hate what's going on, your Redeemer lives and is real. So let's bring that truth out to to the world. So let's rise and let's go out. You know how it works. You got the bold. We go from this place into a confused and hurting world. But we can choose the path we will take. So, we will follow the path that will us by Jesus Christ. Trust, trusting in God, let's bring love into a world that desperately needs it. Let's be the church God calls us to be. God, bl- Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a good week. <laughs>